when President Obama gave his address on winning the Nobel Prize, he said he thought it was sometimes just and even morally necessary to go to war to protect people from being slaughtered by their own government. When he said that, people didn't pay much attention. I think people thought maybe it was a throwaway line. A lot of presidents have used lines like that. What's striking about the war in Libya, whether one is for it or against it, is that it shows that President Obama was serious, that he actually meant what he said, that he actually believes that's a justifiable use of American power. Now, there are good arguments you could make on either side of that. People could say they don't believe in humanitarian interventions at all, or they think this is the wrong one. Why not Darfur? Or why not one of the other countries around the Mediterranean that's in ferment right now? Or why not in the Persian Gulf? But whether it's the right one or the wrong one, what's striking is that President Obama, unlike his recent predecessors, has taken the position that the America, one of the things the American military will do in the world is intervene to protect people to, to, who are being slaughtered by their own government. And that's an enormous break with America's practice. Today we look at self-defense as the axiomatic case, where everyone agrees that's when you can go to war. For the early thinkers, that was one of the weakest cases because, as Augustine liked to say, you should never go to war out of love for yourself, but only out of love for others. So for the early thinkers, the notion of protecting someone else by force was a stronger case. Nowadays, when one country says it's going to intervene in another for humanitarian reasons, we tend to be skeptical, but I think that's our cynicism. What I'm trying to get at is that we need to develop a moral language, an ability to talk about war because it's so very important, to talk about war without regard to a party or country, but rather in the sense of what's fundamentally right and wrong. What is it that in a just society and a just world, force should ever be used for? The hardest question in warfare is always the question of intelligence, always the question of can you rely on what you think you know about your enemy's intentions. If you're going to invade another country that's not invaded you, it's important to make sure you're right. It's important to make sure that you're really confident in the information that you have. Because if you're not confident, if you're wrong, you end up going to war in a place where you needn't have done so and perhaps causing additional destruction. If the administration wants to make the strongest possible public case for the war in Libya, it's important that it try to explain to the American people and to the world why it was so certain that atrocities would be committed unless the West intervened quickly. Because it's that, that quickness, that intervening before there's a chance to debate in Congress or debate anywhere else, that has a lot of people concerned. And I think what the administration ought to do is make public at least some version of the evidence it was acting on, the reasons that led it to believe that slaughter was imminent. I think the president did us a great favor, in a sense, when in his Nobel address he invited us to think and talk about just war theory. America is the mightiest military power on the face of the earth. 42% of all the money spent on defense in the world is spent by the United States. We have a preponderance of power virtually unrivaled in the history of the world. We as Americans have a responsibility to think in moral terms about when it's right and wrong to do that. So without regard to whether the, this president or any president presents the case for war in moral terms, I think that Americans have a responsibility to think about the case for war or against war in moral terms. What just war theory does is it gives us a vocabulary to think about those moral questions. It's not a perfect vocabulary. There might be a better one out there. But it supplies a vocabulary, a vocabulary that asks us to think, is there a just cause? Is this the last resort? Can the use of force actually do the thing that we claim we are setting out to do? And is our use of force proportional to the problem we're trying to solve? When we ask questions like that, we're asking moral questions. I think those are the right questions to ask. There are a lot of things the American military does around the world, which it's able to do quickly and efficiently because of its military organization, which we otherwise wouldn't be able to do. But the military also fights. And the question I think that all of us as citizens have to ask ourselves is what should the military fight for? Most of us would say, well, defend the country when we've been attacked. But is that all? 
In my book, I suggest that it is appropriate at times f to use our military in the humanitarian sense. The great case is Rwanda. Uh, in Rwanda in 1998, when you had somewhere between 750,000 and a million Tutsi slaughtered by the Hutu in a very short period of time, the United States, like the rest of the West, stood by and did nothing. President Clinton later said that was the greatest failure of his presidency, and I think it's absolutely right. I think it was a grave moral mistake by the country that is not only the leader of the free world, but also the preeminent military power in the world, to take the view that it's going to do nothing as 750,000 people are slaughtered is simply a blot on our history. There are things we cannot stand by and allow to happen, and a slaughter of that degree, I think, is one of them. Not long ago, the Defense Department uh, began to award contracts for what it calls the last manned fighter. That is the last generation of fighters that are going to have pilots in them. After about 2030, 2040, somewhere around there, it's expected there'll be no more pilots, that everything will be um, a drone, which is a remarkable change in our vision of warfare. But already we fight very heavily through the use of pilotless drones that can stay on station for many, many hours, and in some cases for many, many days, fire missiles, in some cases drop very heavy bombs. In the opening of the Libyan conflict, how did the war begin? It began with the firing of 124 cruise missiles from uh, ships and submarines uh, offshore, 122 American missiles, two from, um, uh, from Britain. A lot of warfare is like that these days, and that is a big change in how we think of warfare, and the biggest change is that one side is not putting its troops at risk. When we simply bomb and we simply send missiles, we don't risk our lives. Now, I'm not saying we need to risk our lives, but there are two interesting things that happen when you make a war entirely by standoff bombing. One is the public forgets about it after a while. It, it, it disappears from the front pages. If you have, when America has troops on the ground and people are dying as well as killing, it's on the news every day. When we're using standoff bombing, when we're using missiles that kill but place no risk, it fades from the nation's consciousness. That means it's easier to fight, which means it's more likely that we'll fight. So the less risk is involved, the more likely we are to fight. That's one of the problems that arise from this modern form of warfare. But there's another problem that we don't think about as much. If you're going to use all of our magnificent array of precision targeted standoff ammunitions where someone can sit literally in a control room in Nebraska and control a drone around the world, you need really good intelligence on where those missiles are going. Because otherwise you're going to blow up a lot of wedding processions and make a lot of enemies instead of hitting the Al-Qaeda leader who you thought was in the car but really wasn't. That's the other great risk. Uh, that is going to be run. And I don't know what the answer to that is because our technology is moving ahead by leaps and bounds and our willingness to risk lives is falling as I think it probably should fall. But this may suggest we'll fight more and more. We'll just do it in the standoff fashion using missiles from a distance which means that because there's little risk on our side people pay less and less attention. And we should always pay attention when we're fighting a war, whether our lives are at stake or not. It's important to remember this, that, that the fact that we send people out to die is the existential problem of war. The fact that we send people out to kill is the moral problem of war. And the moral problem is the same whether we're doing it at a distance or with, as we'd like to say, boots on the ground. The existential problem is very different, and it's the existential part that scares us, our side dying. And that should scare us, but we should also be worried about our side killing. That's a great moral problem that arises no matter how the killing is taking place. I wish we'd turn to just war theory more than we do. We have a kind of instinct for it. I think all of us have an instinct that uh, we should use moral terms in talking about war, but we don't do it enough. In the end, we fall back on the partisan sniping that makes America sometimes such a miserable place to, uh, uh, to be. Uh, but I think we have an instinct that war is different. That's a good instinct. We should follow that. And I think whether one is for or against the war in Libya or Afghanistan or anywhere else, that President Obama did us a service when in his 2009 Nobel Address he invited us to use the teachings of just war theory 
as a moral language for discussing warfare. It may not be the right moral language, but it's a moral language. It's a language that lets us come to grips with the fact that war is different from the other things we do, that war is a far more serious business than the other things we do and deserves a language of its own.